Please be seated. Would you pray with me? Grant to us your Holy Spirit, O God, that we might sense the joyful secret abiding within us. Grant to us the Spirit of Truth that we might dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. In the military, they are called Mustangs. A Mustang is one who has served as an enlisted man or woman, and then through further education rises to take a commission as an officer in that branch of the military. My first captain was a Mustang. He was hard. But he was fair because he knew what it was like to be an enlisted person. Yes, those of us on our ship had a love-hate relationship with the man. John Grisham writes many different kinds of novels and where he is best known for the mysteries, the murder mysteries. But I find that there are two or three particular books that he has written that would move beyond that and, and dare to enter the realm of literature. One of those is entitled Bleachers. It tells the story of a young man who, some years after he graduated from high school, he's employed in another city. He receives a letter or a phone call to invite him back to do the eulogy for his high school football coach. And we are allowed to enter into the struggle that this young man has, his utter hatred of that coach and his other love of that coach. A dynamic tension, what shall I say, and still be true. And finally he settles on what he can consider the truth and say that the eulogy, the memorial service of his once coach. He made a man out of us. What is the measure of a man? What is the measure of a woman? What is the measure of a person? Plato, the measure of a man is what he, and we will add she, he does with authority and power. The measure of a person is what they do when they have power. We read of an unnamed Roman centurion. He had at least 100 Roman soldiers at his command. He was the representative of Roman domination of Palestine. At his very word, someone could be flogged. With the approval of the governor of that province, he would carry out orders to execute. And as a centurion, you can bet he was not loved. He was hated and he was feared. At least we think so until we read our text. It is a well-worked axiom 
that power corrupts in absolute, power corrupts absolutely. You, yourself, have known people who have risen to power. Perhaps it was a common friend that you had and they received a great promotion at their employment and suddenly they look down at you like, oh, you lower species of creature. We say, oh, it's gone to her head, it's gone to his head. They believe what the papers are writing about them. A sure sign that we have gone in the wrong direction. Perhaps the centurion was a Mustang, risen through the ranks because of heroic deeds. It happened often in Rome that an enlisted soldier would be given a commission because of heroic valor on the battlefield. He could have been a proud man, a vainglorious man, a man who basked in his own reflection. But what did he do? He made friends with the people he was to rule. The elders of the synagogue. And we read in all parts of the Bible how nitpicky they could be. The elders represent him when his slave gets sick and they come to Jesus. And they say, this man cares deeply for us. He loves us as a people. He even built our own synagogue. He's a good man, a righteous man. Measure of a man is what he or she, a person, he or she does when they are given authority over people. And this centurion loved people and built place of worship for those people. What is the measure of a man? What is the measure of a woman? Again, we hear the voice of the Greeks. Socrates, this time, know thyself. Know thyself. Now, you probably never heard Clint Eastwood acting as Dirty Harry in church. And you remember all of those Dirty Harry movies, there was one memorable line. Make my day, and on and on. There's one line that said, a man has got to know his limits. The elders say of him, he is a man worth doing something in return. He is a man worth you, Jesus, healing his slave. He's worthy of it. And then Jesus begins to go and follow the elders back to this centurion's home and then came another messenger who quoted the centurion as saying, Do not bother coming to my house, for I am not worthy to receive you under my roof. He was a man bloodied in battle. He was a man who knew what bloodlust was. He was a man that had seen the horrors of hell, men killing each other because this country didn't like that country. And maybe it is that he is kind to his slave and to the people he rules and building a synagogue. Maybe it's because he's trying to make up 
of a person also has to do with faith. Martin Luther King Jr.'s statement, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. You know, it's really easy for us to claim faith in God when we are given the privilege to sail the glassy seas. You know, chop on the water. But where do we stand when the waves rise and the torrents of rain fall and, and we, it seems, our ships of life are like matchboxes tossed to and fro? The test of real faith is found in the difficult times. This centurion is losing a slave that he has loved. He sends for Jesus. All you have to do, don't come to my house, I'm not worthy. All you have to do is say the word. Say the word in my slave will be healed. You don't have to be there. You don't have to be pleasant. And you don't find Jesus shocked. Pretty much throughout all Scripture, what is maintained is Jesus knows, kind of one step ahead of all of us. But in this case, you can almost feel did Jesus' mouth open up in awe? And he says to everyone around him, I tell you not in all of Israel have I heard of the faith this great. The measure of a person is found in faith. This man is not a Jew. He is a Gentile. This man is a part of the army of occupation. This man had not heard the Sermon on the Mount. He had not heard the Great Commandment. This man knew nothing about the Trinity or the divine human re relationship of Jesus the Christ. He had simple faith. I spent a greater portion of my life playing around with the nuances of Christian faith, exploring many strange things that perhaps you have no interest. But if I were to summarize my faith statement, it would be this, and I am not the first one to say this. I know there is a God, and I am not He. And I wonder, though, I think we in the church forget a simple law. The law that says that the church belongs to God, not just this one, anyone. The church belongs to God, not God to the church. And 
in our personal lives. We belong to God as an individual. I belong to God, not God to me. God doesn't belong to me. There's an old quote, ancient, God knows those whom the church knows not. And the church knows those whom God knows not. They write that one down and figure it out. My friends, let us not be deceived for one moment that dogma is not the same thing as faith. We can know church government, we can know scriptures, and we'd be able to quote chapter and verse correctly. We can have continued our education in theology till we are filled to the brim with it. But I will tell you this, when the hard times come, and surely they do, the question that we have in our heart is not about, well, how do you be fully divine and fully human and still the same person? I can tell you it's not. The real question is, can I trust God? Can I trust God that God still loves me when I've erred? Can I trust God that God is still present when I feel the void. Can I trust God that even if I must throw off the mortal coil, God will be with me as God has been with me my whole life. He will be with me in life everlasting. All of us should answer the question, what is the measure of a woman? What is the measure of a man? It's how we use authority. It's knowing the depth of ourselves. And finally, it is the simple faith. The faith that says, Oh God, you have the words of life eternal. There is nowhere else we can go. Is there? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen.